All right. Well, let me let me get going here. I'm going to pull up my slides and hopefully give me a minute to make them look pretty and get my setup going. What I've got is I've got three monitors in front of me. So on one side, I've got chat and I can see those of you who are at least showing your faces. And then um, on the other side is I've got some other information that's going to be helpful. So I assume that this is looking pretty for you, uh, which is good. And all right, so let me let me dive into this. So this is uh, all about what do we need to think about in terms of developing ourselves or developing the leaders that we work with for 2021, uh, right? There, there's no um, probably disagreement that 2020 is stretching us quite a bit. And so as we move forward into the future, we need to think about how do we navigate this environment? So I've got two purposes for this webinar. And really it's to answer two chunks of questions. So this first chunk is, is really two questions, which is what is the biggest leadership development need for 2021? And how do we best address that need? The second question is, is how can I help you do this? So uh, this, this is going to be essentially 75% presenting you with some content that I think you'll find really interesting at both a personal as well as an organizational level. And then the last 25% uh, is going to be a little bit of information of how I can help you with this if that uh, is something that uh, you're looking for some help with. And I've got a belief regarding what I'm going to present. And this belief is that what we cover will help you see more clearly, perhaps more than ever, how to improve your personal development and the development of your leaders. Now, I think that this is going to be a really critical shift in perspective, because if we don't make this shift, which I'm gonna suggest here in just a minute, we're gonna continue on the same traditional course for development, which I'm gonna present some statistics that suggest is not as effective as we would like. But if we can make this shift, we're gonna create a competitive advantage for ourselves and our organization. So let me start with two questions for you. And I, I do want you to respond in the chat, book, uh, chat box as we go through this is, here's the first one. What do you think is the biggest challenges facing leaders or that leaders are facing as we move into 2021? All right, so we got Tanya who's saying transition from boss to coach, right? Which I think is always uh, an issue. Accepting change, economic stresses, uncertainty. Katie saying communicating with remote workers. Brad leaving geographically dis dispersed teams. Jose engaging people. Tracy managing organizational changes. All right. So what I'm what I'm hearing as I try to look beneath the surface in some of your responses is that there is increased complexity. And there's also increased uncertainty about our future. And because of this complexity and certainty and everything that is going on in the marketplace that's related to the COVID pandemic, uh, moving virtually is there's a whole lot of change that's going on. And leaders need to be able to effectively or more effectively deal with all of this complexity, change and uncertainty. Now, so if we think about this is, okay, this is our new normal is the term that's being used. How good are organizations generally at developing leaders to address these challenges of uncertainty, change, and complexity? So give me a scale on, on one to 10, with 10 being really good, one being you know really bad. How good are organizations generally at developing leaders to address uncertainty, change, and complexity. All right, so I'm, I'm seeing a pretty consistent three to four, right? We're, we may not be, we're not doing nothing about this, but I think we clearly see that we could be doing something more. And I think the statistics bear this out. So here's a few statistics that I think you'll find interesting. First here is, Organizations spend $356 billion a year on leadership development. 
Yet 75% of organizations rate their development programs as not very effective. In fact, in my own research, I found a similar percentage. I found that two in three organizations cannot agree that their leadership development efforts are effective. And this is one that, that's really stood out to me is 71% of organizations do not feel their leaders are able to lead their organization into the future. So I've got three statistics here, A, B, and C. Um, out of these three, which one kind of stands out the most to you? Go ahead and chat that into the chat box. All right, there, there's no right or wrong answer here, but but this, um, you know, A or C, uh, the, the, I, would, I would personally vote A or C even above my research, but, but what A is suggesting is we are doing a lot of work, but it's really not paying the dividends that we would hope it would be. And then C to me is really concerning as we think about what we're stepping into with 2021, or even really what we're waiting in currently that is not going to be going away anytime soon. So we're not, I think what C suggests is that organizations are not doing a great job of developing their leaders to navigate complexity, uncertainty, and change. So why, I, I'm just interested in your perspective. I'm gonna give you an answer to this, but I'm also open to hearing your perspective. If you could chat in the chat box, from your perspective, why aren't leadership development efforts more effective? What are you seeing um, or experiencing maybe yourself? There's short term, which I think is right, focusing on the wrong things, mislabeling the problem or the issue. Learnings are not implemented in practice. So it's, I'm, I'm getting the sense that there's maybe two themes as I'm looking over this. Um, is one, we may be not focused on the right things or overlooking things that would be better to focus on. And then two, we're not capitalizing on what we're already doing, um, which I, I think is, and all of these are really great answers. Right? And, and even Greg is suggesting is it's hard to get leaders committed to doing these trainings. In fact, as I work with organizations and their top leadership teams, one of the things that I've experienced is that uh, oftentimes the organization uh, and really the executive team will bring me in. They say, you need to help our, our people become more agile and future ready. And I say, great, let's do it. So I come in and do a webinar and then all of the employees are saying, this is fantastic. Um, but we don't feel psychologically safe. Like our executive team isn't really helping us in that regard. Uh, are you doing any of this work with them? And then I go, I go back and I say, hey, were any of you on the executive team on this workshop? And nobody was on. And I, I kind of asked, what, what message is that sending to the organization? Talking to L&D folks in, those, in these organizations, they're saying, it's really hard for us to get in front of our executive team. One, they're busy. But two, they kind of think that they know what they need to know in order to be effective. So, so it's, I mean, it's complex in terms of the answer to this question. But let me, let me give you a perspective that has been a huge light bulb moment for me recently. And I think will be a big light bulb moment for you. This is the shift that I was mentioning at the beginning that I think can become a competitive advantage for us if we understand it and then make, take action on it. And then it all is founded upon the idea that there are two types of development, two primary types of development. And the first type of development is what I would call horizontal development. This is when we add more knowledge, skills, and competencies to what one already has. The other type of development is vertical development. This is elevating a person's thinking capacity to better navigate more complex and uncertain environments. So when we consider these two forms of development, I think they each have a different focus. And I, I think that each are important and that we need to focus on both. But I, I also think that we focus on one a lot more than we do the other, which we'll get to. 
So the focus of horizontal development is largely on doing more. So it's if we've got an iPad, we are adding a new app to the iPad. This is going to allow us to function more broadly than what we had in the past. When it comes to vertical development, the focus is a little different. The focus is on being better. So this isn't just adding an app onto the iPad. This is upgrading the iPad or upgrading the operating system on which the iPad operates on. In fact, we've got an iPad here at home that my, my children use, and it's about six years old. And it is now to the point where most of the apps that we want to download, we can't even add it on our iPad because it's not those apps are not compatible with the older operating system that we currently have. And the only way we're going to be able to use those apps is if we upgrade to a new iPad, which we plan on doing. Um, but I, I think that this is a great analogy because I think oftentimes what happens is leaders, they develop themselves vertically to the point where they can navigate the current situation. But as the environment around them changes and becomes more complex, more uncertain, then if they only stay with their current level of vertical development, they're going to be limited. And I, let me kind of demonstrate that to you as we go along. But let me ask you a few questions here. Is when you consider the difference here between vertical and horizontal development, what would you say is easier? You can just type in an H or a V in the chat box. Right? So we're all agreeing that horizontal uh, development is easier. What would you say is most commonly focused on? Horizontal or vertical? All right. So most of us are saying horizontal, which is my perspective. In fact, people who focus a lot on these kind of topics, they suggest that 95%, if not more, of all of leadership development focuses on horizontal development. It's a lot of Here's what you need to do to be effective. But we can tell leaders all day long all of the things that they need to do, but if they don't enhance their mental capacity, upgrade their operating system, they may not even be able to implement these doings that we're encouraging them to do. And so we've got to ask ourselves, will horizontal development get us what we need from our leaders as we move into 2021. Um, and so I would, I, I mean, I guess you could chat in and answer if you want to on that question, but what I'm guessing and what I'm suggesting to you is that horizontal development, again, it's not bad. It's just probably not going to give us the development that we need in our leaders for them to navigate the change that is going on, the uncertainty, and the complexity in the world around them. Now, to, to make more sense of vertical development, let me talk you through a few principles associated with this. So one is we need to understand the difference between child and adult development. So there's been a lot of research on child development. There's been some research on adult development. And it, it is significant, but much less than child development. Now, when we look at these two different types of development, we can break it down a little bit in terms of the number of stages, the pace of development, and the effort required. So when it comes to the number of stages, what most experts and researchers have found is that children generally go through five or more stages of development from birth until adulthood. Once we, when we look at the adult development literature, almost all adult development literature um, suggest that there's approximately three stages of adult development. Sometimes you'll see four stages. I rarely I'll see five stages. Um, but, but usually it boils down to three different stages of adult development. This means that when we look at the pace of development, children develop quicker than adults, given that they're going through five or more stages in about 20, 25 years and then three stages for maybe the next 50 years of our lives, if we get there. And that's a big question because then it come, we need to think about the effort required. 
And what we know about child development is that this is rather automatic. It's a function of age. Adult vertical development requires intentionality. It is a function of effort. And not everybody goes through that effort. So what are the three, these three stages of adult development? And here's uh, one of the best kind of ways that I've seen it presented is at the, the lowest stage, effectively what every adult gets to is a dependent stage. This is, they're a team player, they're a faithful follower, follower, they're part of the group. This group is a part of their identity. They want to support and, and promote and push forward the group. The next stage up is what's called an, inter, an independent uh, individual. These are, we're more achievers. So we become an independent thinker. We're self-directed. We want to drive an agenda. We take a stand for what we believe and we're guided by an internal compass as opposed to what the group says we should do. So we, we still kind of identify with the group, but we also have our own ideas. And then the highest level of, a, of adult development is to become an interdependent thinker. We're a collaborator, where we see the systems and patterns and connections. We're a longer term thinker. We hold multiple frames of perspective. We hold contradictions. Um, to me, I can't help but when I present this information is just to reference um, our recent presidential election, as I'm sure, like myself, as you probably had a lot of conversations regarding our presidential options and the election. And you get some people, as you, if you're anything like me, as you can identify some people as more dependent thinkers, right? They just fall in line with whatever camp that they're involved in, red or blue, at least here in the United States. There's other people that are independent, which is, I kind of lean towards this group, but I've also got my own things that I prioritize when I vote for a candidate. And we've got some interdependent thinkers that are, that are willing to weigh into the complexity that is involved in a presidential election. And they generally don't take as strong of a, as strong of a stance as what we find with dependent and independent because they, they actually appreciate the complexity. And here's some, some research on this is in terms of what percent of the population falls into each camp based upon what Robert Leahy, who's one of the leader, leading researchers of adult development, he's found that 64% of the popu adult population falls into this camp. 35% falls into the independent camp and, and what he's found is when he works just with business leaders, this is the camp where most business leaders fall into. And there's only a very small percentage of, the, of leaders and of people as a whole that fall into this top level of development. And if we think about, we're going to be in, we are wading through an incredible, incredible amount of complexity, uncertainty, and change is which one is gonna have the greatest capacity to navigate this? Well, I'm gonna kind of show you a, a, a slide here that demonstrate those ideas in, in just a couple of slides. But before I get there, I wanna just mention one thing that I think is really important. Our level of development does not signify our worth. Somebody who is at a dependent level is not worth any less than somebody who's at the interdependent level. Everybody has value. So here's a quote from the Center of Creative Leadership. He says, well, it's true that late stage thinkers are often better matched for leading in complexity. This doesn't make them better people. My five-year-old can think in more advanced ways than my three-year-old. That doesn't make him a more valuable human being, just a fraction more developed. So, so when we talk about vertical development, this isn't a weapon to wield but it's something to understand because the reality is, is while worth doesn't change, this, our level of development does affect our processing and our behaviors. So if we've got two people, person one and person two, both facing the same situation in terms of the magnitude and complexity of the issue, well, they can have different levels of vertical development. And in this particular instance, because both of them have an altitude of vertical development that exceeds the magnitude and complexity of their situation, they're both going to be able to navigate this situation rather effectively. Maybe 
person, person two may not be able to navigate it any more effectively than person one, because it's a pretty simple issue and they, they both have what it takes to do it. But when the magnitude and complexity of the issue or the situation goes up, now, now there's gonna be a distinction where in this instant, person two is going to be able to navigate that situation much more effectively than person one. And, and I think what I mentioned this uh, before we kind of started the webinar is a book, this is inspired me to read a book and also our, our presidential election inspired me to read Nelson Mandela's autobiography. Like what, what, what did an individual have to go through to get to the point where he could spend 27 years in prison, come out and ask for forgiveness over a struggle that had been going on for essentially half a century, which is the, uh, the apartheid there. And it's been really eye-opening, but it suggests that he, Nelson Mandela probably, and I'm not saying he was a perfect leader, but had achieved an altitude of vertical development that allowed for him to navigate that really complex situation in a rather effective way. And I'm still learning about him, so I, I'm not you know, putting my foot down on that, but that's, um, that's uh, hopefully helpful. I'm looking over here at the comments uh, here and, and Jethro says, don't we all think that we are interdependent? And I think what we do, and I also think that it's possible for us to be interdependent with one sphere and not interdependent in another sphere. Uh, and I think that that's probably pretty common. And then when we see ourselves as an interdependent thinker in one sphere, we kind of assume I'm interdependent in all of these spheres. Which, which probably isn't the case. So the question here then is if we understand this, how do we go about elevating our leadership or elevating the, the, the leadership within the organizations that we're working for? And, and I think that the solution boils down to something that leadership development has largely overlooked. And, and this is the mind. Now, I, I would be interested if, you're, if you agree with me on this. So, so let me present this information. I'll, you can give me a yes, no in the chat box. But I believe that most leadership development approaches are rooted in, in theories that were, that were developed pre-2005. Would you agree with that? Give me a yes or no. So Katie's quick on the trigger. She's all over this, right? So I think we're all we're we're all saying yes. Is we these were developed pre two thousand five, but what we've got to understand is we've learned more about the mind in the last fifteen years than all of time before that. So what that means is that when our current leadership development approaches were developed, or at least the the theories associated with them. They did not include the mind because they couldn't. We didn't know enough about the mind. And so as we carry these forward, and again, it's not that we are blatantly want to avoid the mind. We just haven't integrated it very well yet. And so this is, I think, where we need to focus on if we want more of this vertical development. We've got to focus on the mind. But one of the things that you may be thinking is the mind is so complex. What do we even focus on with the mind? And, and I'm going to give you a really quick answer, and there's a huge amount of depth behind this, but I believe that it's our mindsets. And I believe that we can uh, point to mindsets from two different perspectives, both psychology and neuroscience have identified mindsets as being the most foundational mechanism that governs how we process and operate. And, and I, you know, we could spend some more time. And in fact, if you want me to, to do some work for you, um, we could dive into this topic uh, in pretty great detail. But to try to summarize this is what both psychologists and neuroscience has, has found is that mindsets hold three jobs. In fact, what neuroscientists suggest is that our mindsets are the circuit board for our mind. 
is they, they, they drive and dictate what they call our global neuronal workspace, that everything gets filtered through our mindsets. And this is because our mindsets have three primary jobs. One is they filter in specific information. Then with that information that is filtered in, because we can't process all information, so we're going to filter in certain information depending upon our mindsets. We're going to inter uh, interpret that information in unique ways depending upon our mindsets. And then depending upon the information filtered in and how we interpret it, we're going to activate different processing and behavioral responses based upon that situation. So for example, if we, um, this is just ripe on my mind as I just got done writing some exams for my college students, is what happens if we fail on an exam? Well, we're probably gonna wanna filter in this information. That's, that's pretty something that's pretty weighty. Then how do we interpret this? Well, I get some students who interpret this as uh, it's crushing. This is a blow to who they are. Uh, they, they now interpret this as though they are a failure. Other people interpret maybe a failing exam as, man, this is, uh, I just realized that I didn't, I didn't adequately prepare for this. And how can I learn from this experience moving forward? And depending upon how the information filtered in, how it's interpreted, they're gonna behave very differently. So most of my students that, that fail on the exam, they kind of see themselves as a failure and they give up for the rest of the semester. Those who see it as an opportunity to learn, they're the ones that are the first ones lining up in my, in my office now virtually, wanting to know how can I improve for the next exam, right? We see, we see this in, in related situations all the time. Now, here's, here's a really interesting study. And if you've read my book I, or, or seen other webinars, you've probably seen this, but I think it's so fascinating and it drives home the point of the power of our mindsets. In this particular study, individuals took a mindset assessment and they identified individuals that had more of a fixed mindset and other individuals that had more of a growth mindset. And then they were all given an exam with eight easy questions and four difficult questions. They wanted to see how would they respond to failure. What they found is what I just articulated is those with a fixed mindset, they went from being rather pleased with themselves as they got the eight easy questions right to depressed as they got the four difficult questions wrong. Their thoughts denigrated. They started to beat themselves up and they even gave up. Whereas those with a growth mindset, they hit those hard questions and they started to encourage themselves. They dug in more vigorously and they remained confident and optimistic. Now, which approach, now that we see this as a third party perspective, which approach is a more vertically developed approach? Right? It's, what we're seeing here is these individuals are reacting. These individuals here with a growth mindset, it almost as if it may be automatic to them, but they're intentionally and thoughtfully responding in a much more healthy way. And I think if we went back and asked all of these individuals, did you handle this situation in the best way possible? Both groups would have said yes. But the reality is, is that only one group handled this effectively. And when I work with organizations, the mindset that the top level leaders struggle with the most is a fixed mindset. Is they become largely focused on a need to look good. Because if they, if they don't look good, then they're left to internalize this as, as, as they are a failure themselves. So when I do my work with organizations, and if you've seen my material, you know that I focus on four different sets of mindsets, not because they're my good ideas. They're just what have been researched over the last 30 to 40 years. And I focus on four different sets of mindsets. And, and I help people awaken to the current quality of their mindsets along each of these continuums and where they need to go to move forward um, more effectively. And at, I did some research recently that I think you'll find uh, interesting. And I asked a group of, if I remember off the top of my head, I think it was 153 different organizations. What do you focus on for leadership development? And all of these are leadership development folks. And here are the most common responses. So 72%, for example, 
said they, they focus primarily on communication and interpersonal skills. 54% on developing management skills like planning and decision-making, 50% on leadership styles, et cetera, right? I, I got a pretty big list, but at the bottom of this list, here's what I found. These were the last five. Mindsets came in at 18th at 12%, mindfulness at 19 uh, with 10% and negotiation lower, and, and you could see, see the others there. So I, this is one question that I asked. The next question that I asked is how effective are you at developing your leaders? And then that allowed me to tie in what topics do they focus on that leads to the most effective leadership development. And here's what I found. So I found that 12% of the 12% that focus on mindsets, 67% of them agree that they are effective at developing their leaders. Cultural, culture development was the second highest, leading teams the third, mindfulness the fourth. And then towards the bottom is where we see the other more common aspects that are focused on, such as communication, interpersonal skills. That only leads to effective leadership development 41% of the time. Again, because this is a horizontal approach to developing leaders, whereas what is up here is much more of a vertical approach to developing leaders. And I think that's the difference that we're seeing here. In fact, as a whole, as I mentioned, I saw that 12% of, of organizations focus on mindsets, 67% of those that did said they're effective at developing their leaders. So for the other 88% that didn't focus on mindsets, they were only 29% of them agreed that they're effective at developing their leaders. So it's, we're, according to this data, we're going to be over two times more effective at developing our leaders if we could focus on mindsets. So uh, let me give you a, a couple of examples here of, of one, an individual, and another is a company. And so this individual, his, his name is Greg, and there's a friend of mine named Greg who's, who's on this call. This isn't Greg, it's another, he's a CEO of an organization. Um, and, and let me tell you a little bit about him first, and then I'm gonna dive into Microsoft. I think you'll find these uh, examples interesting. So Greg is the CEO of a high-performing company. I've underlined high-performing because they're really doing well. And, and he, he runs, he's the CEO of kind of one region of this organization. And it's one of the most high-performing regions in the, in the entire company. And he's got a problem which is why he reached out to me is his, the turnover of his key staff is inhibiting continuity and growth. What he's kind of feeling is we've been going through a lot of turnover and every time we do, we have to restart. He's just kind of thinking in his mind, we would be so much more ahead if we didn't have to go through all these restarts. So something that he's proactively done is he's done some exit interviews. He's hired another firm to do some exit interviews to find out what's going on. And what they found is that these positions for this key staff is they're, they're saying it's a rather high pressure environment. They've got a lot of responsibility and a really short leash. You know, what, they're, what their experience is, we're getting trained up, but once we go through that first 30 days of training, if, if we have mistakes, we're out. We, we kind of get pushed out. And so I asked Greg about this. I said, why this pressure? And here's, here was his response. He says, I trained them but if they don't catch on quickly, I don't have patience for them. And I wonder if they will ever get it. Now, I don't know about you, but when I heard this, and as you read this, don't you get a sense that there's just something about Greg here that isn't, that is causing him to inhibit himself, that he's got some sort of fears or insecurities here that is preventing him from having this patience. And so as I worked with Greg and, and uh, also some of his other team leaders, um, then, then what we help them to do is to become more self-aware of the role that he is playing in this turnover problem. That it's maybe your lack of patience that is creating this rather stressful environment for your employees. And now that he recognizes this, he's awakened to his mindset-driven fears and insecurities that were preventing him from having the positive influence he wanted to have. When we boiled this down, as we identified that the mindset that was hanging him up the most 
was an inward mindset. And so now that he knows about this negative mindset that he's been carrying around and it's associated with fears and insecurities, he's now more, much more conscious and intentional when his key employees struggle to pick something up. In fact, I just talked to him two weeks ago and he, he just said, I had a situation come up and I felt like I handled it so much better than I have in the past. And I said, that's, that's awesome, Greg. It, it's clear that you're doing this vertical development work so that you could become more of the leader that you want to be. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. And Tanya seems to be getting it to where Greg is the cause of his own problems. But it, it's not very easy for leaders to see this, particularly when we're not talking about things like mindsets and self-awareness. And so part of it is we need to help them awaken, which as we awaken to these things, naturally this will invite enhancing our altitude when it comes to our vertical development. Uh, Chitel uh, says, you mentioned that mindset is a circuit board of our mind. Um, they've been identified as our global neuronal workspace uh, by neurologists, um, which, which effectively serve, means that they're the circuit board of our mind. So hopefully that helps. All right, let me, let me walk you through a great organizational example that deals with doing some mindset work and that is Microsoft. So Microsoft, um, under the tenure of the prior CEO, Steve Ballmer, which was 2001 to 2014, during this time, Microsoft's market cap and stock price stayed consistent. What this meant is that Microsoft was one of the largest companies in the world in 2001 and it, wasn't that way in 2014. So many of their competitors have flown, had flown past them. But something happened in 2014 uh, that changed things around and, and Satya Nadella took over as CEO. And what has happened since then has been incredible, is their market cap and stock price has quadrupled. Is there anybody here who owns Microsoft stock? I'm curious if there's anybody. As soon as I as soon as I read Satya Nadella's book, hit refresh. That was one of the first things I did, uh, which which has uh, been a pretty good decision. Uh, seeing what's happened, I'll, I'll show you that here in just a minute. But as Satya Nadella took over, that he saw some things in the organization that he knew he wanted to be changed. And here here's some of the things that he saw. He saw that leaders felt this need to look good, that they can't make mistakes. They needed to be know-it-alls. But what he wanted is he wanted them to be okay making mistakes in an effort to learn and grow. He wanted them to be learn-it-alls. He, he saw that you have to be right and to have all the answers, right? You've got to be the smartest person in the room. And what he wanted is he wanted people to recognize that you don't have to have all the answers. But what we need to do collectively is we need to seek out the best answers and to find truth. He saw that leaders were focused on avoiding problems. They didn't wanna look bad. Uh, in fact, they had kind of some performance management systems uh, in place under Steve Ballmer that meant if you look bad or had problems, you're gonna get a really poor rating during the next round of evaluations. And the, but what Satya Nadella wanted is he wanted them to focus on reaching goals, feel safe to explore, try new things. He also saw that they, they were focused on providing customers with what they thought their customers would need. But what he wanted is he wanted their employees to ask customers what they need and then go about creating it. And so these are all of the shifts that he's been focusing on. And the benefit of this is what you see here on the slide is here's 2014 when he took over. This is their stock price. And you could this is below 50 if you can't read the numbers. And right now it's, it's up above 200. I mean, it's incredible the difference that has happened uh, as Satya Nadella has tried to make these shifts in the organization. And again, we can ask ourselves, which side is more vertically developed, right? It's, it's over here on the right. It's the idea that if a mistake or a problem occurs, we don't punish people for it. We sit with it, right? That's not an easy thing to do, particularly, you know, if you're a very visible leader like Satya Nadella. 
So what did Satya Nadella do to make these changes? Well, he focused on mindsets. And here's all some, some things. I won't go through and read them through. But if you have a little bit of time, you might be interested in YouTubing Empathy Museum and, and look up what they did do. It's really fascinating. And it was a way to bring about more of the outward mindset. So, so mindsets became his dominant focus because what he realized, and this is just to summarize what I previously presented, is that leaders in Microsoft felt the desire to look good, be right, avoid problems, and get ahead. Now, answer, um, answer this question in the chat box. Would you say that society suggests that these are good desires to have? Give me a, a yes or no there. All right, so I think society suggests that these are good desires and have, and we could even change this question a little bit, is that what do, do leaders feel like is their social pressure as a leader to look good, be right, avoid problems and get ahead? Yeah, there's probably a lot of pressure as a leader for these things. But these, I mean, these are very justifiable because who wants to look bad, be wrong, have problems and get passed up? Nobody, right? But where is our focus when we have these desires? It's on ourselves. We are in self-protection mode and these desires are fueled by these negative mindsets. And oftentimes I think when I work with leaders, oftentimes they're here because one, because they're justifiable, but two, because they don't understand that there's better premises to operate from. There's better desires to have, which are fueled by more positive mindsets, which is we need to have a desire to learn and grow, which means at times we're going to have to be okay with looking bad, right? We're going to have to be able to sit with complexity. That requires vertical development. If we want to have a desire to find truth, at times we're going to have to admit that we've been wrong. Again, that requires vertical development. If we want to be able to reach goals, we've got to be willing to wade through problems. If we want to lift others, at times we're going to have to put ourselves on the back burner. Again, all of these things here on the right require vertical development. Um, and uh, yeah, I could go back a quick slide here, John, which were the things that Satya Nadella focused on. Um, and again, you could, you could look up Empathy Museum on YouTube. So I, I think that this is just such a great case study of an organization that focused on mindsets as a way to vertically develop their people and the benefits of having done so. So really we need to help our leaders and even ourselves move out of self-protection mode and get into organization advanced mode. And the thing that I think is, is pretty in incredible about this is, let me give you another case study. This is an organization I've worked with recently. And we use my mindset assessment to assess their mindsets at time one. And then six months later, we reassess their mindsets. And, and in that time period, um, we had done one webinar and given them some material, like they could get access to my book. And then they did some book clubs in the organization. That was really all they did during those six months. But here's the changes in the mindsets that we saw in time two. Now, I'm not, they still got a lot of work to do, but in each area, there was a significant shift. And as I, as I worked with their, their folks in this organization, we came to the realization that this was not because of contextual factors, but it was likely and largely because they just were exposed to new ideas that they hadn't seen before, that they previously, you know, up until this point in time, in time one, they just kind of thought that their mindsets were the best mindsets to have. But when they were awakened to the idea that they can have better mindsets, they naturally went there. And so, so that's, this is hopefully shows some of the benefits of even just doing a few small things can have within an organization. Of course, the more that we support this, the, the greater the shifts. So let me, let me stop here and see if anybody has any questions related to what we've been talking about here, which is largely 
okay, what we need in 2021 is we need vertical development. And I think one of the best ways to get at that is through a focus on mindsets. So any questions pop up for any of you? You can either type those in or even pull yourself off mute either way. This will allow me to get a little drink here. So Ryan, can I make a comment? Uh, yeah, for sure, Phil. Or am I excommunicated from, no, I'm on. <laughs> no, uh, go ahead. I think a lot of our CEOs uh, think of all those, they don't call it a development, they call it training. And training is educating people cognitively Whereas the mindset notion is an emotional concept, which if you embrace the emotional concept will lead to behavior changes. And I think that's, that's how I differentiate the two. You know, one is skill development. So if you, uh, you learn how to make a presentation, that doesn't mean you practice it. You mean that you learn it cognitively or you learn good how to write well. Um, but the, uh, the other is through mindset, um, really is um, tapping into your emotional state and helping you uh, uh, grow as a leader to become more effective. So that's, that's the only commentary I'd add to your uh, really good presentation. No, it's great because when we, when we understand the neuroscience behind mindsets, that our mindsets, what they actually do is they integrate the three major brain regions, our reptilian brain, our mammalian brain, and our human brain. And, and if our mind isn't integrated well, which when it's not, we usually take on the negative mindsets, is we become driven by our emotional reactionary responses. But when our mind is more integrated, we're able to be more intentional. So Brad asked a good question, how far can self-awareness in these tools take people before they would need professional therapy to help them overcome mindset blockers? And this brings up something that I've done a lot of research in the last four to six months is the role that trauma plays on our mindsets. So in trauma can be big T trauma or, or little T trauma, but the effect of trauma on our mind is it's, it disintegrates our mind so that our three major brain regions don't work as effectively together. So I think for most people, well, and I should mention trauma is more common than what we would like to think, even big T trauma. But, but for most people, what I've found is just by talking about these things and helping them to be more self-aware, that's all they need. And in addition to some support in terms of giving them some resources. There's other nuts that are a little tougher to crack, probably because they have deeper seated trauma that has affected them. And at that, for those people, they probably do need some professional help. Um, so it's not going to be the the, you know, just focusing on mindsets is not going to be a resolution to all of our organizational problems with our leaders, but it allows us to better understand where our leaders are coming from. Um, and, and when we start to throw in terms like trauma, it becomes easier to also talk about personal and organizational health as a whole. So hopefully that helps. Um, what if our leaders are not focused on the vertical mindsets? So is what I find is we end up when we focus, we will generally focus on either doing nothing or focus on horizontal development. And if, if we solely focus on horizontal development, what I find is that leaders, they're like a hamster. They just are doing more and more, but not really getting anywhere. And that's the only way we're going to get somewhere is if we go through some sort of vertical development. Yeah, uh, Tenny is asking, how do you connect mindset change to the experience change? For instance, short-term assignments in another location. So what, what we've learned is that to get vertical development, there is a necessary but not sufficient condition. And that is they need to have a heat experiment or, or experience. And that may mean taking on a new position, a stretch position, something along those lines but it doesn't have to be that. Uh, and in fact, I think just by exposing people to their mindsets, having them take my mindset assessment, getting a report, 
um, that it can, it can be a heat experience for those individuals. And maybe many of you are on this call today because you've had that experience. Um, so I, I think it's helpful to think about how do we create a little bit of heat that allows for us to capitalize on it. But again, a lot of leaders experience a lot of heat, but they don't capitalize on it. And that's why it's so important that, that we, they get the support and, and the help to be able to vertically develop when those heat moments occur. Um, and I'll hopefully I'll come back to some of these other questions. Let me just, uh, because I know we're running out of time, let me just wrap up with a few things in terms of, okay, how can I help you? Well, I, I focus on vertical development of leaders through the focus on the mind and more specifically on mindsets. So I kind of have two general topics that I focus on when I work with organizations. One is general leadership development. And the other is agility and future readiness, which are both of them are intertwined. And we're really doing both uh, when, we, when we're talking, taking either approach. But in terms of kind of um, marketing, it, these are the kind of the two marketing approaches. And we could look at vert, agility and, fu and future readiness, both in terms of the, at the personal level, but also how do we as a leader help create a more agile and future ready culture. And I, I would say I broadly have two approaches, but all of my approaches are, are really customizable for what you need. Um, is I could do one-off sessions. And I think that there's a lot of power, even though it's just one session, in terms of helping people awaken to themselves and deepening their self-awareness. But then I also do workshop series. And again, these are largely customizable. But here's an example of four commonly kind of different sessions that I'll cover, usually in 90 minute workshops. So we'll start with vertical development, integration of the mind and mindsets. We'll do a deep introspective personal dive to facilitate some vertical development. If we're a group that this would be conducive to, we'll do a collective deep dive to see if the group as a whole is self-sabotaging themselves. And then how do we go about shifting our mindsets to more fully vertically develop? In all of these approaches, I generally will have them take my mindset assessment, and then I will aggregate those results up to the collective level to produce a collective mindset report. This is you know, an example of one slide that I've used. We, we focus in on different mindsets. And if we have a sample size large enough, we could break it down by different groups, such as female and male, or different departments or non-exempt, exempt. We could look at different tenure levels. So we could dive into the mindsets at different levels, which gives us a sense in this instance, what, the way that we interpreted this data is what you'll see is the females had much more negative mindsets than males. Is we interpreted as this, as in this organization, females didn't feel as psychologically safe as their male counterparts, um, and, which was a huge takeaway for their executive team. So other things that I can help you with is I've got my book, Success Mindsets. I've got a tool called the Digital Mindset Coach, which is a micro learning tool to help, help uh, on a regular basis activate and stimulate your positive mindset neural connections. I do have an online course called High Octane Mindsets. If you're looking for a, a really deep, introspective, deep dive, I could do some coaching at a one-on-one -on -one level or small group later level or train the trainer. So. Um, as a summary, I think that traditional leadership development efforts aren't very effective because they primarily focus on, on horizontal development. And we need to focus on vertical development. And if we could do that, this is gonna give us a competitive advantage. We're gonna be able to navigate the complexities of our world much more effectively. So to enhance our leader's vertical development, we've got to focus on the mind and specifically mindsets. And, and this is something that I would love to help you with. So if, if this is something that you want more of, uh, you could chat in the chat box, just learn more. And then I, I could send you an email and we could connect. Or you could just book a time with me by, by typing in uh, this link and, and we, can, we could connect further, which, which I look forward to. Um, so as a whole, what I said at the beginning, and I'm just going to leave this up, I'm looking off uh, uh, of the next slide, is I hope that you more clearly see that if we can make a shift in our perspective and understanding the difference between horizontal and vertical development, we now position ourselves to more effectively develop ourselves as well as the leaders we may be working with. 
And if we don't make this shift towards focusing on vertical development, we're going to keep doing the same things, which just aren't super effective. But if we can make this shift, we're really going to create a competitive competitive advantage for our organization. And thanks for chatting that in, uh, that link in Jethro. I, those weren't things I was planning on doing. So that is, that is it for me. And as a thank you um, for joining, if you haven't read or listened to my book, I'm, I'm happy to give you a free audio book. So I'm going to pull down my slides and so that I could copy this and, and paste it into the chat box. But I, um, I really appreciate you joining me. I want to take further questions. I know that there's other questions that have come up. Um, and I, I know that our time is, is limited. Um, but I'm happy to stick around uh, for a little while and chat through any questions that you have. Um, so Shital, thank you for uh, coming. I'm glad you found it to be great. So is there any pressing questions that any of you have? I could go back and scroll through the chat or what you can do is just kind of pull yourself live and just ask me. And that's probably gonna be the most effective way to, to close out here. But if you don't wanna stick around for Q&A, uh, then uh, thank you for coming. It's truly been a pleasure and uh, hopefully we'll be able to connect here in the near future.